official end of summer and honor American workers, we're reminded of the major contributions immigrants make to the workforce. A new report by the American Immigration Council finds nearly half of today's Fortune 500 companies were founded either by immigrants or by their children. These 224 businesses brought in a combined $8.1 trillion in revenue last year. That's more than the GDP of most developed countries, including Japan, Germany, and the United Kingdom. It's a glaring reminder to Congress, as they return from summer recess, to focus less on deterring migrants and focus more on bringing them into the fold for the greater good of the United States. As my next guest puts it, quote, the sooner our legislators recognize the value in not just the people in positions, but the incredible innovation they can bring, the sooner we'll have something even more meaningful to celebrate on Labor Day and every day. With us now, Krish Omera Vinaraja. She's president and CEO of the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service and former policy director for Michelle Obama. Krish, thanks for joining us. Talk to us about the real impact of migrant workers on America's economy. Well, I think you've highlighted it in, in terms of at least talking about the you know Fortune 500 companies. Um, the truth is that immigrants are invaluable um, in uh, contributing to our workforce. Um, they make up about 13% of the overall population, but they're 18% of the American workforce. And we're not just talking about low-skilled jobs either. Obviously, as you mentioned, um, they've contributed $7 trillion um, in revenue. They, uh, through those Fortune 500 companies, um, they are critical in industries ranging from healthcare to IT. Um, they are an engine of our innovation. And so our point is that if we are going to address the strength of our economy, then we have to realize that immigration is a win-win because without it, Medicare and Social Security won't be afloat, nor will we be able to fill the 10 million jobs that are right now unfilled. You know, you make such an important point there. It's, it's the mark they're making as business owners, yes, but also as workers, as employees across so many different industries. And we saw, especially during the pandemic, how vital immigrant workers were uh, and how they helped keep our economy going. What do you say to people who claim immigrants are taking jobs away from Americans born here? I think if you look at the last couple years, what you see is an economy that has been grappling with inflation, that has in large part been driven by the lack of immigration in the last couple years. I think that the nativists who are xenophobic are undermining our economy. They're undermining our strength as a superpower in the, glo in, in the world. Um, they're not recognizing that we have an advantage over countries like China and Russia, where people tragically are willing to risk their lives to come to our country. So let's stop political grandstanding and let's recognize that we face a demographic clip. Uh, we face a crisis, but it's not the one that political pundits talk about. It's about the fact that we have an inverted pyramid, that we have an aging workforce, and we have the lowest birth rate since the census has been tracking this issue. And so we need to figure out, instead of making this a political hot potato, how to fill the jobs that are unfilled right now, how to create the jobs that immigrants create, and how to foster the innovation that gives America its competitiveness. In New York City, there's been a humanitarian challenge to house migrants. Uh, I want to take a listen to what Mayor Eric Adams said about this on Thursday. When I spent the night in the asylum hurt that we created and spoke with the asylum seekers, they were clear. We don't want your free food. We don't want your free bedding. We don't want your health care. We just want to work. We want to have the opportunity to do what everyone else had the opportunity to do. And we're saying we must expedite work visas. It's just common sense. Krish, what do, you, what do people misunderstand about the, the will for asylum seekers to work so they can provide for themselves and their families? There's a self-selection that happens in terms of those who are willing to risk their lives, who are taking treacherous journeys to come to the U.S. 
They are driven, um, they're risk takers, they're willing to fight for a better future. And they are the kinds of people that, as Mayor Adams mentioned, they want to work, they don't want handouts. And that's where we as a country need to figure this out because we need them as much as they need us. And so whether that is Congress entertaining um, a change to the law that requires asylum seekers to wait six months or uh, the federal government, meaning President Biden, granting, um, for example, Venezuelans temporary protected status so they could work immediately. We need to make sure that we understand that this ought to be a bipartisan issue. We're talking about Republican governors of Indiana and Utah who are saying, let these individuals work. And so I think there is a real opportunity for us to put politics aside and to figure out what's best and in our own interests, but also the right thing to do in terms of providing an opportunity opportunity for these families. And you mentioned two ways to release the pressure here. One of them that sits in Congress's lap, which is to shorten the waiting time so that they can actually get a permit to work. And the other one for the White House to extend temporary protective status to Venezuelans, which would also allow them presumably to be able to work. Uh, what do you see as the likelihood of either one of those things or both of them happening? Well, I um, get nervous in advance of the presidential and obviously uh, watched with some real consternation um, the Republican debate where you had uh, candidates trying to outperform one another in terms of being xenophobic and anti-immigrant because that's not what our country needs. But I do hope when I see um, senators come together to propose reducing that wait time from 180 days to 30 days, um, I have optimism, and I really do hope that our political leaders will show leadership and figure out what's not just the right thing to do, but the smart thing to do. Krish Omera Vinaraja, thank you, and happy Labor Day weekend to you. Coming up at the top of the hour, Georgia's governor.